Do you ever have an empty table at home that you just cleaned off? Do you notice it doesn't stay empty very long? Starts filling up. That's what happens in a service when you leave silence and a preacher near the front that's got words. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with us to the book of Colossians, the first chapter. I'm going to begin reading at verse 21. Would you stand with us? Out of honor and respect to God's holy word. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Thank you. You may be seated. Sin is an attitude or disposition that's contrary to the mind of Christ. Now, I've got a question for you. Have you ever tried to work with a person who was contrary? I did not say, have you tried to live with a person who is contrary? I didn't say that. Although I'm suspecting there's a few of you that may be thinking it. <laughs> have you ever tried to work with a person who is contrary? You can say, what a beautiful blue sky it is today. And they'll say, it's purple. No matter what you say, they will come back with something different. Their whole attitude, their whole mindset, their whole demeanor is adversarial. It, it, they find a problem in any and everything. No matter what direction you choose to go, they choose to, cho they choose to head another way. Have you ever tried to work with a person who was contrary? Sin is an attitude that is contrary to the mind of Christ. Christ says, go this way. Those with the mind of sin says, nope, I'm gonna go the other direction. I'm gonna choose my own path and you're not going to direct me. Now, when we come to Christ, when we become a believer, this contrary attitude, it has to change. We move from being contrary to being cooperative. And this morning, I want us to think for just a few minutes about how God wants to change us when we come to Christ. Once we've come to Jesus, God begins his work in us, but he doesn't complete his work in us. He continues to work even after we have come to him. Amen. Some of these changes happen immediately. Some take a little longer. But let's think about some of the ways that God changes us when we come to Christ. First of all, God changes how we relate to him. 
In Colossians 1.21, the first phrase is, once you were alienated from God. That means you were separated from him, you were estranged from him, you were in a, on a different uh, wavelength than he is, you were, you were living a different way than he would want you to live. Before coming to Christ, we were alienated from God. But once we come to Christ, we embrace God as our friend. We respond differently to those that we perceive as friends. We trust them more. We hear them and listen to their words more easily. We respond to them less prickly. You ever met somebody that was kind of like a cactus? You really didn't want to embrace them too much because you're going to get poked. But when we, when we embrace someone as a friend, we're less defensive, we're less fearful, we're more relaxed in their presence. You see, coming to Jesus makes all the difference in how we relate to God. John Sutherland is an officer in London's police department. He explains a principle in forensic science, forensic science that's called Lacard's Exchange Principle. It was developed by Dr. Edmund Lacard, known as the Sherlock Holmes of France. Okay. Well, this principle is really pretty simple. It says every contact that is made leaves a trace. In criminal science, it means that every criminal leaves a trace behind him. One forensic expert put it this way, wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as a silent witness against him. Not only his fingerprints or his footprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the pain he scratches, the blood he deposits or collects, this evidence, this is evidence that does not forget. And so the principle is that in every crime scene, there is something left behind that if found can point to the contact that was made there. But this applies not just to forensic science not just trying to catch criminals. John Sutherland made this point, every time two people come in contact with one another, an exchange takes place. Whether it's between lifelong friends or passing strangers, we encourage or we ignore. We hold out a hand or we withdraw it. We walk towards a person or we walk away from a person. We bless or we curse. And every single contact leaves a trace. The way we treat and regard one another matters. It really matters. Jesus came, died, and was raised again that those of us who have done wrong in God's sight might become God's friends. He, he wants us to understand that our contact with him, our relationship with him has changed. And he wants those continuing contacts to be strong and solid. But he wants us to be dispensers of his grace as well. And every person that you come in contact with as a follower of Jesus Christ, you should leave behind a little 
little bit of his love, a little bit of yours. As we relax in his presence, he changes us. He encourages us and inspires us. We are changed. Let's offer that gift to others. He strengthens and lifts us up. We're made better. Let's leave a little bit of that wherever we go. He calms and comforts. <laughs> you know, there's so much political news on today. I heard someone say the other day, there is so much going on. I would like for there just to be one day that I can turn on CNN and not be scared out of my wits. If you spend a lot of time watching this stuff, you can be really inwardly agitated. But God wants us to remember that no matter what's going on around us, he's the one that's ultimately in control. He's got our life in his hands and we're safe there. <coughs> I think this world needs some people that understand that they're walking around on a firm foundation, that they're secure, and it's going to be okay. Don't you want to hang around with that kind of people? Amen. Don't you think this world needs some people that can have a calm assurance about them? God changes how we relate to him. He changes us. And he makes it possible for us to be influencers in the world by helping to spread that change to others. God changes how we relate to him. And, and in Christ, he makes us better. A second thing. God not only changes how we relate to him, but he changes our thinking. In Colossians 1.21, once you were enemies in your minds. I'm suspecting that at one time or another, many of us, maybe all of us, have had a thought something like this. Things have been going so bad today. God must really be ticked off at me. Anybody ever had that thought? You don't have to confess. There are times that our life starts feeling like a country music song. It's been a really bad day, an even worse week, and the last decade ain't been so hot either. Lost my job, my landlord evicted me. My wife ran off with my best friend. Boy, do I miss him. <laughs> That's the song. That's the song. My dog left me to go live at the pound. And worst of all, my pickup truck won't start. <laughs> I'd sing a verse of Jesus, take my wheel, but I'm pretty sure he'd drive me into the nearest telephone pole. I must have done something bad. Sometimes in our mind, in our mind, we imagine that God is against us. We may even imagine that he is out to get us. And it's really hard to feel good about our Heavenly Father when we start thinking that he's out to destroy us. But the reality is this. The only place where God is out to get us is in our mind. In coming to Jesus, 
we learn the truth, we learn the reality that God is for us. We hear the gospel, the good news. God loves me in spite of the bad stuff I've done. Amen. He's willing to forgive my past. He offers me a chance to start over. And instead of being out to get me, God is for me. Yes, yes. But then when we come back to that, he's out to ruin me stuff bouncing around in our heads. Theologically, there is a term for that. It's called stinking thinking. It's just wrong. God is not out to get you, and he never was. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's not out to get us, he's out to save us. Jesus would never die for someone he was out to get, yet he died for you and me. He loves you. Once you were enemies in your minds, but the only place where we have been unloved, the only place where we've been God forsaken is in our puny, mixed up, confused little heads. The truth that we must start to live by is very different. It is this, God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. And if we can get that truth into our head, if we can understand that his grace is unlimited, that his mercy is ever flowing, that his goodness is unfathomable, his love will never let us go. If we can get that into our head, our minds will be changed, our life will be changed. Yeah. Before we move on, I need to say one additional thing. Bad stuff will still sometimes happen. Sometimes several bad stuffs at a time. But instead of blaming God for being out to get you, sometimes we better ask a different question. One of them is, what have I done to make matters worse? I've learned something along the way. Maybe you've learned it too. But if I could kick the person responsible for most of my problems, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. <laughs> Life. Life with God even expects us to take responsibility. for our problems, our difficulties. But we've got to change our thinking. And we can't blame God for the messes that we have made. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a pretty good mess maker. And then, thirdly this morning, when we come to Christ, God changes the way we behave. Colossians 1.21, once you were alienated from God because of your evil behavior. Before we came to Christ, our behavior offended God. We found all kinds of ways to displease him, to violate his laws. We lived without regard for what God has told us is right or good. But when we come to Christ, he makes us new. And our new life includes changed behavior. I want us to, to look at verses 22 and 23. Listen to these. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death 
to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. So, let me sum up. He's taken us from the life where we were against God and living in a God-displeasing way. He has now reconciled us by Christ and he is presenting us holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. But then there is that big word, if, at the beginning of verse 23. It looks like a little word, only two letters, but it's really a big word. Because it says that this happens if we continue in our faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Hmm. God changes me, but he wants me to cooperate with him by staying changed. He doesn't want me to crawl back to the old ways, to the disobedient ways, to the rebellious ways, to the I'm against God ways. He wants me to stay changed. He wants to me to continue in my faith. He wants me to be established and firm. And he wants me to refuse to move away from the hope that is held out in the gospel. And he wants that from you as well. Yes. Now, you remember we talked about some people who are contrary? I'm sure we're talking about no one here. <laughs> but one time we were contrary to God's ways and contrary to Christ's mind. But when we came to Christ, now instead of being contrary, we're supposed to be cooperative to God's ways and to God's mind. But we're supposed to stay cooperative. We're not supposed to go back to being contrary again. The change in us is behavior that's supposed to stay changed read a story recently of a uh, small town church in rural, rural Indiana. They were kind of surprised one Sunday morning when a biker came in to visit. He didn't look like the rest of them. He had a ponytail, he was tattooed, he was wearing biker's clothing, but the church I looked at him and said, I think we're supposed to love this guy. So they did. They showered him with love and they accepted him. And he came back. And he kept coming back. And eventually, he came to Christ. Now, there, there was one strange thing about this guy. No matter what time of year it was, he always wore long sleeves, and it wasn't because he had on a suit jacket. Even in the hottest days of summer, he had long sleeves on, and one day he finally confessed to the pastor that he had a tattoo of a naked woman on one of his forearms. He didn't want other people in the church to see it. About three weeks later, Biker walked up to the pastor and said, want to see my new tattoo? And he began rolling up his arm and the pastor thought, oh, no. <laughs> Biker continued, you know that naked woman tattoo I told you about a while ago? Well, I had the tattoo artist put clothes on her. <laughs> changed behavior. When we come to Christ, we change our direction, change our thinking. We 
change the way we live. We change the way we relate to God. And we're supposed to stay changed. We're supposed to start acting like Jesus. And we're supposed to keep acting like him. Truth is, all of us were contrary with God at one time. Contrary to God and contrary to the mind of Christ. We want our own way. We prefer our own desires. We want to indulge our own passions. We want our own wishes to be met. But God didn't create us to be contrary. If you go back to the very early parts of Scripture, you find out that God created you and me in his very own image. (laughs) He'd rather have us stand with him. He wants us to have a right relationship, a cooperative relationship. He wants to renew us in his very image. So when we come to Christ, he changes how we relate to him. He changes how we think. He changes how we behave. And his great purpose in saving us is to restore in us his very image. He wants to make us like Jesus. I got a question for you. It's a real simple one. I'm speaking mostly to believers, to those that have accepted Christ. But the question is this. Are you cooperating with what God is wanting to do in you? Is your attitude and spirit toward him saying, yes, Lord, I'm trying to do what you want me to do? If it is, keep doing that. But if you find that the real truth is that you're being a little contrary, well, you need to knock it off. You need to get back on the cooperating side. Now, God's come across this a few times before. I'm sure there's a person or two somewhere that he's had to deal with that got a little contrary. But you know, every time, every time that a contrary person confessed and asked for God's forgiveness, he said, I forgive you, and let's start over. And he'll do that with you as well. Father, would you help us, each and every one, to be cooperative with what you're doing in us. Take away our contrariness, Take away our mindset that is against the the heart and the will and the direction that Christ wants us to go. And let us be the people you want us to be. And give us strength and help as you work to effect your change within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Jesus paid it 
Father, make us cooperative with your will, cooperative with your heart, cooperative with what you're doing in us. Bless these, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.